<coughs> excuse me, do we have a quorum? Um, I, I, there are a couple members I'm, I'm sure will be here <coughs> momentarily. We have a relatively brief agenda today. We have one gubernatorial appointee appearing today, and that is Arthur L. Anderson, Jr., as a member of the Board of Parole Hearings. And let me welcome you uh, to, the, to the hot seat. It's not that hot. Let me welcome you and, uh, and invite you to introduce uh, any member of your family or special guest um, to make a brief opening statement, and then I'm sure that the members will have some questions for you. Thank uh, you for thank coming. Thank you, sir. Uh, I don't have any family members here. Uh, I do have a, a, a special guest that will be making a statement earlier, I mean later. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> on my behalf. Uh, in, in terms of opening, opening statement, uh, it's a pleasure to be here before uh, all of you again in terms of uh, my confirmation hearing. Uh, uh, I have uh, over 40 years of public service, starting with the military and uh, ending with uh, 35 years in the California Highway Patrol, where I ascended through the ranks and ultimately uh, uh, retired as Assistant Commissioner of the, of the CHP. I have a, a strong background in uh, community service. I have served on numerous boards and commissions throughout the uh, state, including the Sacramento region. I uh, am currently a, a board member of the March of Dimes and have accepted the March of Dimes to help raise several million dollars for uh, premature babies. I also have served on the boards of directors of uh, Friends Outside that assisted uh, uh, children of uh, people who have been incarcerated. So my uh, community service is wide ranging. My commitment to public safety is, uh, has been one that has been there from my entire uh, public service. I still am committed to my uh, position. I am uh, fair and, and I believe that uh, uh, carrying out the uh, government's objectives of ensuring that uh, public safety is maintained uh, in the state of California. Sir, thank you. Um, Thank you very much. I know I've uh, got a couple of questions, if I may. Maybe it's all right with the colleagues. I'll, I'll give it a, a start today. Um, this is a, an important job in state government that you, that you hold because your decision, your discretion determines a lot about public safety, obviously, but also about the life of uh, of an individual and a human being and whether or not they can live freely. And I want to start by asking you about Marcy's Law, which we know is still tied up in the courts here. What factors do you use when, when hearing a case to determine whether a person who you deem not to be eligible for parole at the time gets a 15-year denial, a 10-year denial, or a three-year denial? What are the factors? Well, sir, the factors I utilize is, is following the provisions of March of Law. Is there a clear and uh, present uh, reason why this person is a uh, public safety danger at the time? And, and the way I determine is I utilize the regulations to determine does the person have uh, insight into the committed offense. In, in other words, do they know why they're in prison and have they addressed those issues? Have they been, been involved in uh, programs to uh, rectify the problematic errors that they may have had in their criminal history? I look at their social history and any kind of problematic errors there, and how have they addressed the uh, issues that may have arisen uh, in terms of their social history? I also look at uh, uh, their parole plan. So I look at um, overall uh, mental health and attitudes towards the crime. Now, factor each one of those in, and each person is different. You weigh those and determine has this person uh, done enough to qualify for parole, or do they need more time? And the individuals who get the more uh, lengthy periods haven't done anything. And uh, the ones who get the lesser periods are progressing, but they still need a little bit more time. Uh, to qualify themselves to be suitable for parole. Let me ask you about uh, an issue that arose during the background uh, 
in preparing for this hearing, and that is the issue of the board procedures around assigning attorneys to represent the inmates. Some attorneys are, are as the result of the inmate hiring or retaining that person. Some are appointed by the board itself. And our staff believes that there is a significant difference really in the quality of representation based upon levels of training between board appointed attorneys and attorneys who are retained by the inmate or the inmate's family on the outside. Is it, do you believe that to be the case? And if so, what are you as a board member doing to rectify that? Well, uh, the board, is, uh, Senator, does not assign the attorneys. Uh, however, uh, when we have an attorney as a board member who needs to look at a specific issue because of maybe lack of training or not lack of knowledge, I bring those issues to that attorney. I will, I will agree with you, there is a, uh, um, a, vari a variance between the level, skill levels of different attorneys that come before the uh, board in terms of representing the inmates. Uh, the attorneys who are, I guess you can say, uh, 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 paid outside of the normal state process uh, generally uh, take cases where the inmates is well prepared and they come in and uh, they do an exceptional job in terms of uh, putting on a, uh, a case for the inmate's suitability. So the issue I think would be on a part of those who hire the uh, state appointed attorneys in terms of consistency in their training and consistency in the standards that they have. And I'm not aware of what those standards are because I'm not an attorney and I'm not, I don't go to their training, but th they should have the same knowledge uh, whether it's in Southern California, Northern California, in, in terms of giving the inmate the best representation that they can. Thank you. Uh, Senators, Senator Alquist. Thank you very much. Um, some things I will not ask because we talked about it in private and I've mentioned publicly with, with, with the, the other uh, nominees, we've talked about medical parole and recidivism. So I won't ask questions on that today. But I will basically in two different areas. The first one, uh, psychological evaluations. Okay. Um, in 2010, the OAL found that the board's psychological report process was an underground regulation. In response, the board submitted a proposed regulation to codify their psychological report reports. And then as I also talked about on May 5th of this year, OAL denied the board's request to codify the regulation allowing for the psychological evaluation. So I have three questions in regard to that. First one, and this will sound familiar too, is what authority does OAL have over the board with respect to psychological risk evaluation and report process? Uh, the OEL does not have authority over the board with respect to the psychological evaluation process. What the OEL has authority for is rulemaking in the state of California. And the board, I mean the OEL can, uh, is the um, office of, uh, of uh, authority when it comes to rulemaking of any state organization in the state of California. And so what happened is the OAL, uh, Office of Administrative Law, required the uh, BPH to uh, develop a regulation. And that regulation was developed at the request of uh, OAL. Uh, and the psychological evaluation was not part of the OAL's approval process, only the regulations. And what occurred was that the uh, uh, OAL um, reviewed the package and determined that part of the regulatory uh, uh, process was in error and they sent it back for correction and gave the BPH 120 days to make those procedural corrections, which they're in the process of doing. So just, thank you. So just briefly, can the board still legally carry out these psychological evaluations without regulation approved by the OAL? Yes, Senator. Uh, the board still utilizes the psychological evaluation without the approval of, of uh, OAL because the, the O, uh, AL did not, does not approve the use of the psychological evaluation, only the rulemaking process. Okay. The psychological evaluation is still a tool that is utilized by board members. 
Okay, the last part of this question is when OAL states the board did not rely on any technical, theoretical, or empirical studies in consideration of these, of this regulation, what impact does that have on you and how you use and consider these evaluations? The, uh, the impact of that uh, decision from OEL did not impact board members in utilizing the psychological evaluation. Uh, again, uh, uh, it was a procedural issue in terms of the paperwork with regards to the regulation. Board members are still utilizing uh, uh, psychological evaluation as part of a risk assessment as part of the overall tools, tools that are available to board members to utilize in terms of determining suitability and unsuitability. So this has had no impact on you? No, Senator. Okay. Then my last question, just really briefly, I um, understand that the board has vacated at least two of your decisions, and I've received information that your decisions have been reversed, some have been reversed by the courts, and I just wonder very briefly in three or four sentences if you could explain why some of this was done. I, uh, in terms of the process, uh, as a commissioner, I'm always learning. And there are procedural uh, mistakes that we all make as human beings. I'm not perfect. And uh, the uh, courts are there to make sure that uh, we're doing our jobs in a proper way. And so uh, they did it. And, uh, and uh, I'm still uh, doing the best I can to do the best job I can. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. visited um, at length and discussed um, sort of your, your um, in-depth experience about um, what, what made um, you convinced that uh, a parolee was, was ready to go back um, to jo rejoin society. And um, if you just have, uh, from that discussion, if you could just highlight one example of uh, a program that you thought reduced recidivism um, significantly and why? I think uh, that a program that allows any inmate to be involved in developing skills that they can utilize in the uh, free world where they will be paroled to will all ultimately reduce recidivism. Recidivism is because they don't have a way to support themselves. They don't have knowledge to support themselves. One individual that I paroled managed to get a, um, <clears throat> a certificate in drug counseling. And he is now working in the city of uh, Oakland as a drug counselor. And he came back uh, a few months ago and made a presentation to the board and talked about his success and his opportunities of getting parole. And, a, and the most worrying thing that he thanked me for giving him that opportunity to go back into society and may be a contributing member. Thank you, and I think you also at one point mentioned mentoring played an important part for some. Absolutely, uh, a lot of individuals do not have the knowledge and the opportunities to understand what it takes to be a successful individual in society. They've been involved in criminal activity for a large portion of their lives. Uh, I'm aware of a program where you uh, take individuals from the community and you pair them with people that were formerly incarcerated, and that is their mentor. That is a person that they can go to for a resource. That is a person that can help them maintain their <clears throat> attitudes about looking for work, where to go, and staying out of criminal elements. Because when you go back into some communities and you associate with the criminal element, you might tend to recidivate. But if you associate with the one of your mentors, that is a possibility of showing you this is the right thing to do and here's some opportunities for you. And that has been successful around the state and I, and I support those kind of programs. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fuller. Senator Harmon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I've had a, a considerable time uh, to, uh, that I spent with Mr. Anderson, and I have no uh, further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator DeLeon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I also, too, uh, spent a, a lengthy time yesterday 
I'm very satisfied uh, with your answers uh, today as well as yesterday, obviously, and uh, I intend to give you my support, so thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Let's hear uh, witnesses in support of the nominee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members. I'm Phil Vermeulen. Uh, I hate to admit this, but this is my 38th year of working around the halls of uh, the Capitol. And Teen teenage internship, huh? Uh, started, actually, I started when I was five, but uh, <laughs> who goes there? Um, having been around this, these halls for as many years as I've, had, I've, as I've had, I had the opportunity to work with quite a few people. And Arthur Anderson and I have known each other uh, professionally and personally for over 30 years, and I want to tell you that uh, he's one of the most outstanding people that I've ever had the chance to work with. And uh, I think uh, his appointment over the last several years has proven that he is very capable and uh, deserves a full appointment. And with that, I would urge your endorsement of him today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vermeulen. Any other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? Sir? Good afternoon. My name is Keith Watley. I'm a managing attorney at a law firm called Uncommon Law. Uh, I don't really have direct specific opposition to Mr. Anderson. I have a, a, a generalized opposition to the commissioners who don't grant parole often enough because I think the law requires much more than the 13 percent or so that Mr. Anderson grants and and 15.6 uh, well you know there's some interesting higher than a couple of the others we've confirmed uh, in recent times well but one of the misleading things about these numbers uh, and it actually relates a lot to Marcy's law the discussion you had earlier is that um, it is true that the commissioners are granting parole in a greater percentage of the hearings that they complete, but they're completing a much lower percentage of the scheduled hearings because prisoners out of fear of Marcy's law are taking their hearings off the calendar. Less than half of the hearings actually become complete parole decisions from the board. Um, and from what I can tell, the uh, Marcy's Law has had a, either a direct or indirect impact on certainly thousands of hearings, and um, by my guess about, no, better, my, better than a guess, by my uh, calculation, probably 7,500 hearings would immediately back, be back in the board's lap if Marcy's Law is struck down. Um, and the, the, there was some discussion, I know, last week about Marcy's Law and what's happening in the courts. Um, there, there is a split in the courts right now. There have been only two published state court opinions about the constitutionality of Marcy's Law. One says it's good, the other says it's bad. Um, we expect the Supreme Court to settle that. We can't say when that's going to happen. What, what is the concern about the board? I understand uh, we could have a discussion in the policy context around whether Marcy's Law is good law, bad law. Yeah. But what is the complaint about the board? Is it how they're implementing it or not implementing it? Is it just that, as you said, the fact that the law itself is creating, my words, a chilling effect for, for pro inmates to pursue their appeals? Well, one of the things that is lacking in the law and in the implementation is there's no guidance as to how to distinguish a three, five, seven uh, and you asked the question, and, and, and I heard Commissioner Anderson's answer, but it didn't really answer the question because there is no guidance. There's no meaningful difference between a three, Who five, and a seven. It? Who should Who provide should provide that guidance? Well, the law should provide it if that's what it intends. Um, if the statute doesn't, then the regulations should provide it. The regulations don't, um, which would guide, obviously, the commissioner's conduct. And who would be responsible for promulgating those regulations? Well, presumably either the Board of Parole Hearings or the rest okay. of the Department of Corrections could promulgate those, those regulations. So what I hear you saying, if I may, is that you are urging the board as an entity, I suppose in conjunction with the Brown administration, to develop regulations as quickly as possible that would give some guidance as to how to apply the 3-5 
excuse me, the, the 15, 10, and three year denial? Well, uh, okay. no, that's not what oh. I'm urging exactly. I would thought I was close. I know. <laughs> what I would urge is that the uh, Brown administration recognize that this law is unconstitutional and not pursue an appeal uh -huh. okay. of a recent Court of Appeal opinion that strikes it down. That's what I would urge, number one. Okay. Short of that, regulations to meaningfully implement it would be in order, I think. That's helpful testimony, uh, thank you. Um, Quickly. The, 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 the other thing I wanted, you, you talked about the attorney appointment process. The board has actually studied this in the past. About 10, 11 years ago, actually more recent than that, maybe it was more six or seven years ago, the board looked at the process of attorney appointments, found it to be a conflict of interest. They considered whether it made more sense to contract out with a third party provider of the attorney appointments. Uh, they reviewed proposals to do that um, and compared to the board's current process, they found that it's, the competitor could be an outside contractor, could be more comprehensive. Um, it would be, they said, more efficient, provided better training, better supervision, eliminate the conflict of interest, and be cheaper by millions. Uh, and when asked whether they were gonna pursue this, they said absolutely not. Never have they explained why that is. Um, I would urge the Brown administration, the legislature to take that up with the board. Um, the board having already acknowledged that there's some benefit, great benefit to it, but haven't pursued it, I would, I would suggest that you do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. I mean, honestly, your testimony educates me, educated me about what, what you think the fundamental problems are, and I think the administration hears it as well, and now let's grapple with it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Warren. Aloha, Nui Loa. Uh, the one thing, great thing about Hawaiian Airlines motto is it never lands on time. It got in at midnight instead of at 9.30 last night. Um, I traveled about 2,500 miles to attend this hearing today. I'm here to address the subject of the particular nominee. In a particular transcript of which I am familiar, uh, in the matter of William R., uh, a 54-year-old lifer who killed a man and was sentenced to 15 years to life just short of 30 years ago, the nominee not only denied parole but provided for a date 15 years hence for his return, a date where he will be almost 70 years of age. Um, my concern is that in this particular matter, the nominee failed to follow the law and, and ignored both Palermo, uh, Palermo versus Superior Court and McClendon, and Ray McClendon in order to find a chaputous reason to deny parole. And although the words of a transcript are very bland, one cannot tell, I was particularly upset by the statement and some in substance, why did a Jewish chaplain write a supporting letter for a devout Muslim? That letter included a statement that having known this individual for over a decade, I was prepared to have him stay in my home with my wife, my most valuable asset, because I was so convinced that a man who had been discipline free for a decade was a devout man would be of no more danger than a 10 year old child outside. In another case, Connie W. Is, an, is a woman who has been in prison since she was eight, 17 years of age. She was in an automobile with three men who did a drive-by shooting and killed somebody. She's now uh, 52 years of old, has hep C, is terminally ill, and was denied parole because, quote unquote, she represents a threat to public safety. She didn't kill anyone, and she's going to die within seven months. She's causing this, costing the state in excess of $150,000 a year for medical treatment, whereas I've arranged for the Carmelite sisters to take her in for the next year, if she should survive that long, for no more than the cost of any person on public welfare. Yesterday, the CDCR secretary warned the state of California about the dangers as a result of the upcoming court order to release 30,000 inmates. We have to start releasing those inmates who are the least likely to reoffend. Although I was in Hawaii last week watching last week's hearing, I think Ms. Senator DeLeon asked a very important question. He asked, what about the 2% recidivism rate for lifers? That's how many reoffend. Over the decade, more than a decade I served as a volunteer chaplain, I came to know over 3,000 lifers. It is based extrapolating from my knowledge of those individuals. I suggest to you that of the 10,000 lifers currently 
eligible for parole, about 7,000 of them should actually be paroled. 2% are gonna do terrible things. That's the statistical norm, I accept that. It's a terrible thing, but it's a reality. But isn't it better for us to face 140 people doing something bad instead of the 21,000, the 70% of the 30,000 that are about to be released? Because the county jails have no room at the end. There's no lockups. Most county jails operate on a prison farm system. Low security, low level housing. We're placing ourselves in great danger in this realignment. Also, what I fear most about the Ms. realignment base. No, no, no. Okay. The, I'm sorry, Mr. Warren. I appreciate the fact that you've flown from Hawaii to be here at this hearing, but this is a confirmation hearing, Mr. Okay, Anderson. Let me I, I don't want to get into uh, realignment here. I'll go this back is to a, the This is the busiest time of the year with, the, with <laughs> a budget about due, and we want to focus on the I'll, nominee. I'll go back to the nominee. The, the, my other concern is as we continue to only have individuals nominated with uh, public safety backgrounds for the, board, for the board of parole hearings, we are leaving out a significant area of expertise which must be accommodated by providing vacancies for other individuals. One good example, the Jewish chaplain at CIW has applied for the board of parole hearings and has heard nothing. Last week, Senator Steinberg, you were visibly surprised by the lack of participation by so many people. I think one of the concerns for so many people, such as myself, is that we feel that our voices are not heard. Uh, nominees have the opportunity to meet with members. Op opponents simply do not. And it's very important that all of our voices be heard. Um, I'd like to address two points that were raised. Number one, there is no rehabilitation left in the Department of Corrections. It's, it's, it's a crisis, it's a budget consideration, I understand that. And as a consequence, so many men and women who come to the Board of Parole Hearings can't complete those programs which they need. Uh, it is very important that if we're going to succeed in reducing the number of inmates in state prison, that we either invest in them or we re release those who will not recidivate and keep those that will. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, I'm actually very sympathetic to a lot of your views, <clears throat> um, but any forum is appropriate. But here in this forum, we're deciding on the qualifications and confirmation of an individual. You know, I want to continue to work with you in and throughout the budget process, the policy process, the Little Hoover Commission, and every other place imaginable to try to address these issues around the, the compelling issues that you raise. Um, so we appreciate your testimony and want to continue to try to work with you, okay? Thank you. Any, one more in opposition, yes sir. Two more, three more. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Donald Miller. I'm here representing myself and about a, dozen, about a half a dozen law firms for whom I work. I, Received my law degree while serving a life sentence. Got off parole and for about 20 years I've been working on issues involving the parole board and its commissioners. I'm speaking today in opposition to Mr. Anderson and if, it's, if it pleases the committee, I'll also com include these comments for Mr. Auerbaugh who I believe will be next so I won't have to come back here again because they apply equally to both uh, nominees. Go ahead. Um, Nothing I have to say here today is personal. It simply regards the qualifications of Mr. Anderson and Mr. Arbaugh to serve as commissioner. Uh, the first concern should be that the penal code requires that the board be con constituted by a cross-section of the state's ethnic, gender, economic, and so on communities, and it does not. All of Governor Schwarzenegger's appointees, are, except for one who are on the current board, are from law enforcement. These are the very individuals that spent their careers to do everything possible to put these men and women behind bars. So we have, first of all, an inherent bias. Second of all, we don't have a, a cross-section. Third of all, there is no qualification that I can see from their histories that any of these gentlemen have uh, by education or training to determine recidivism, which is the chief duty of a commissioner. 
And that wouldn't be such a disadvantage if it weren't for the fact that about 80% of Mr. Anderson and Mr. Arbaugh's parole denials override the recommendation of a forensic psychologist who's hired by the state for this purpose, who's determined that the release of these individuals would pose a low, if any, risk to public safety. Uh, qualification and knowledge of the law and willingness to follow the law, which is the court decisions, is very important for a commissioner. At least 12 of Mr. Anderson's decisions have been overturned by the courts. Many of these are not published because they're done by the superior courts. All of these cases have had to have rehearings at a cost to the taxpayer. The litigation of about 600 decisions by in the last four and a half years that have been overturned by the courts is enormous. Okay, so there's a tremendous amount of expense involved. Uh, the commissioner respectfully gave an incorrect answer to the committee's question about Marcy's law. Marcy's law and the law that was in effect before Marcy's law was enacted require the decision as to when the next parole hearing will occur, how many years before this inmate gets another hearing, to be based on how long it will take this inmate to be reformed to the point where he or she will no longer pose a risk to public safety. It has nothing to do with the commitment offense, it has nothing to do with the prior conduct, it has to do with that individual's fitness for parole and how long it will take that individual to pose no undue risk to public safety if released. That's based on the forensic evaluation and the commissioner's judgment. I have two, respectfully, two additional points to make which are vital. First is the cost. Not only is the cost of litigation and the cost of rehearings great, but to keep approximately 8,000 inmates in prison, excuse me, oh, I'm sorry, who no longer pose a risk to public safety is a cost of about three quarters of a billion dollars each year to the taxpayer. That's the, the cost of continuing to appoint and reconfirm commissioners who don't follow the court decisions and don't make the decisions based on the law. Last week at your hearing, one of the members of your committee asked why there aren't more women on the board. Then that brings me to the final point. Quickly, please. We have a governor now who would, if given a chance, constitute a board that represents a cross-section and that's qualified. But if the committee continues, and I hate to use the word rubber stamp, but it, it, it's beginning to look that way, the same commissioners, the governor will not be given a chance and, and will have a status quo. Well, I, I think, leave it up to the governor here, uh, but we have not set for confirmation some of the other members that are pending. And, um, and I think that uh, there might be some clarity here that, that would be satisfactory for you at the, at, at the appropriate time. You should talk to the administration about that. But we've, we have not set everyone who is, uh, All right. who is up. Thank you. Thank let, you. Let me, I, and, and I would like to conclude simply with one sentence, that a commissioner shouldn't be confirmed if the cross-section isn't represented, and you confirmed two former law enforcement last time, and if the person doesn't have the qualifications. Thank you. Thank you. I think the point is well taken. We've, we've heard this a lot, and I think it is a message to Governor Brown um, that at least on one side of the aisle, we would like to see some consideration of a diversity of appointments, both in terms of professional qualifications, background, and obviously, you know, race, ethnicity, and gender. Uh, but the, the issue of, look at, law it's appropriate for law enforcement officials to be part of this process, law enforcement folks with that kind of background. The question is whether they should be exclusively predominantly represented, and this is something that the committee has asked about for some time, and I think, and so I think the message is to the administration here that we would like to see, at least the majority, uh, some of that diversity in terms of qualifications. Go ahead. Thank you, Senators. Vanessa Nelson for Life Support Alliance. I will be as brief as possible and decidedly on point with this nominee. We oppose Mr. Anderson's confirmation. We believe he is capricious, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
We oppose Mr. Anderson's confirmation. We believe he is capricious in the use of psychological evaluations, careless with the facts on record, and unheeding of court decisions, giving direction and constitutional correction to the parole board. In doing so, he not only unfairly and unjustly denies parole to scores of prisoners appearing before him, he unnecessarily costs the state millions of dollars in needless incarceration and litigation expenses. Following months of extensive research into the parole hearings presided over by Mr. Anderson, it is clear psychological evaluations, even those done by the board's vaulted forensic assessment division, are routinely swept aside if they do not coincide with his own version of the prisoner's psychological state. Time and again, as cited to the senators in our written presentation, we found psychological reports clearly and unequivocally state the inmate's risk of recidivism and violence is low, and the prisoner has developed insight and remorse to the crime. Yet Mr. Anderson cavalierly tosses aside these reports, labeling them as inconclusive or invalid. Despite the voluminous numbers of transcripts reviewed, we have yet to find a case in which a psychological evaluation unfavorable to the prisoner is so ignored. Discretion in the use of psychological evaluations, while broad, is not absolute, and these reports are not meant to be considered only if they coincide with Mr. Anderson's untrained psychological deductions. Courts have also taken note of this pattern and have frequently reversed his decision, often characterizing his findings as unreasonable and no evidence of current dangerousness or probative of same. Mr. Anderson is also dismissive of the facts in the case, frequently assigning guilt to a prisoner for ancillary crimes or circumstances for which he has not been convicted or circumstances different from the official record. In one case stating as part of the parole denial that he believed the inmate was guilty of an additional crime, quote, I don't care what the records say, unquote. Mr. Anderson should care what the records say. It is the law on which his decisions are to be based and to ignore the facts is to ignore the law. In every transcript we reviewed, we reviewed, Mr. Anderson cited the original life crime as a reason for parole with stock phrases of heinous, cold, cruel, and calculating. Apparently he has yet to assimilate into his repertoire the crux of the Lawrence decision. How much longer do you have to read a statement? Because we'd happily submit it into the record. Um, the best testimony is one where you summarize your, your points and then we'd be happy to take the the written letter into the record. Dan, I can certainly do that, Senator. I will make two very brief points. Thank you. The first one is, while you have quoted Mr. Anderson's rate of, uh, rate of grants, I think it is worth noting that 22% of the time he gave seven to 15 year denials in the cases before him. 22% of the denials were seven? Seven to 15 years. And that means 78% were for less than? Less than seven. Less than seven. Uh, okay. The majority, the vast majority were Yes. people could return and seek their parole earlier rather than later. Yes, but 22% okay. is a very significant number for a seven to 15 year denial on the upper end of okay. the denial schedule. Okay. In summary, Mr. Okay. Anderson ignores the tools the board provides him for evaluation of prisoners, Sorry. ignores the facts and ignores court decisions. For these and many other reasons, we oppose his confirmation and we urge you to vote in denial. Do you want to put the letter into the record? That would be fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other witnesses in opposition? <clears throat> well, there obviously are some witnesses who, uh, who oppose Mr. Anderson as an individual on the merits and then there are others who have a significant concern about not only Marcy's law, but the process and whether, whether the litigants, the parolees, potential parolees are properly represented. <clears throat> and oftentimes the two issues sort of get merged together. Um, I think you're qualified. When I look at sort of where I come from and your willingness to be fair, your rate of, your rate of approval is higher than some of the others that we have that we have approved. I do think though this issue, and I say, you know, Nettie's here, our, fr our dear friend, and maybe the governor's listening on the squawk box. Um, but this issue of, diver uh, of, of diversity and, and qualifications beyond just the law enforcement community, I think is something that really needs to be considered and something that this committee is going to look at very carefully as other nominees come before us. But having said that, I'm prepared to support the nominee today, okay? 
Moved by Senator Harmon, uh, Yes, I also am in support of it. I listened carefully to the testimonies I indicated to the uh, committee and the public. I also had an, a, a considerable period of time to uh, uh, speak with uh, Mr. Anderson. I did want to address uh, one of the comments by one of the uh, people in opposition. It seemed to imply that committee members were not not available to meet with opponents. And in my case, I, I am certainly available. I have an open door, I have an open mind, and uh, anybody that is an opposed to a particular nominee or anything that the Rules Committee does, I invite you to make an appointment to come to my office. And with that said, I would like to move approval of the nominee. Very good, please call the roll. Senators Alquist. Aye. Alquist I, DeLeon. DeLeon I, Fuller. Aye. Fuller I, Harmon. Aye. Harmon I. Steinberg. Aye. Steinberg I. That's five to nothing. Your nomination will go to the to the floor. Uh, I want to thank the senators for their support. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I encourage you to meet with some of the opposition if you haven't already, as well, and see if you can, you know, understand one another. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Very good. We have. Uh, Items uh, one, th uh, one we did two, so one, three, four, five, and seven. We'll separate out six. Yes, that's fine. I'd move approval of those. Moved by Senator Harmon. Please call the roll. Senators Alquist, aye. Alquist I, DeLeon, aye. DeLeon I, Fuller, aye. Fuller I, Harmon, aye. Harmon I, Steinberg, aye. Steinberg I. File item six. This is SCR 18 by Senator Carol Liu relating to public schools. Moved by Senator Alquist. Please call the roll. Senators Alquist. Alquist I, DeLeon, DeLeon I, Fuller, Harmon, no. Harmon, no, Steinberg, I. Steinberg I. That's 3-1-3-1-0. We have an executive session. What? We do have a walk-on, uh, Senator Runner. Uh, it's a resolution on the Senate floor on July the 14th. Uh, substitute the unanimous roll call without objection. Okay, five, five to nothing. And now we go into executive session. We need to ask the...